when you started Mooney Insurance Brokers, how did you know where to go out and get carriers for an independent broker? It's like, who'd you know was going to support you? Because you need, you don't have all State or State Farm, so you're like, I need, I need an insurance carriers, backers for it my was, clients. It was super easy. Um, <laughs> I started not knowing anything. <laughs> And I literally, literally, for all the insurance people out there, I literally started calling carriers. No way. And be like, hey, I just opened my uh, office and I want to represent your company with your products. Sign How do I get signed up? Be like, hey, I just pulled out my droid and it's got Google on it, which is how I got your number. Can you help me? My name's Sean. So... So literally, so I started calling and they like laugh at you. Welcome to the podcast dedicated to real estate, insurance, and everything in between. Join us as we take you along our own brokerage building journeys with additional wisdom from our network of business experts. Welcome to Bricks and Risk. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Bricks and Risk. I'm Tim Garrity. And I'm Sean Mooney. And Tim, today we're going to go back a little ways. Hey. We're going to go back to the beginning of talking about this podcast and why we were going to get started and what the focus was going to be primarily around building businesses. Yeah. And I think we want to look at it like how can individuals be successful in our industries? You know, what roles are available for them and what's out there and how they can succeed. So yeah. awesome way to kick it off. So when Sean and I first talked about the podcast, you know, I'm an, in, I'm in real estate. Sean's an insurance. I almost said I'm an insurance. Ooh. Ooh, man, that was, hey. that was close. Uh, and one thing we talked about that we thought we could really add out there to the podcast universe, if you want to call it, is how can we help you build your business? Because Sean has built his own business, as have I. And being in the two fields that we're in, they're highly entrepreneurial fields. You know, you could be an agent in either real estate or insurance. Uh, you could be an office. You could be a franchise of an office, or you could be an independent shop. And... Talking about it as building your business is really what got us like psyched up about this. Yeah, just the opportunities that are out there. Yeah. And slicing and dicing and what's what's out there and what's the best way to attack it and how, how to be successful is kind of yeah. the way we looked at it. And then we thought, all right, well, let's take our position. And, you know, maybe there's some people out there that, you know, we can uh, give information being on this side of the table going through everything the gauntlet that yeah. we've gone through yep um tips and trips tips and tricks and uh you know how to be successful all right so i'll i'll kick it off so let's talk about three different opportunities to build your business in residential real estate that's what i focus on so let's stick with that yep you can be what's called a solo agent so you go out, you get your real estate license, and you just want to start practicing and helping buyers, sellers, tenants, landlords, and investors. Uh, you could be a real estate team where people do it a lot of different ways, but that's when you're you're leading a small team. It could be two or three of you. It could be 100 people. I mean, teams are humongous these days. It's just a new way. Wait, what's the largest one you've ever seen? I mean, I've had some people that don't own their own brokers that I've heard on different podcasts have as much as 300. On their team. Wow. Yeah. And is that like, what, one person at the top usually? Or is it... Usually. Um, there might be like co-team founders. Sometimes yeah. there's two or three. Two or three. But most of the time, I find it to be one one leader with, with a big staff. Like I heard someone today on, um, I think it's called Real Estate Team OS. It's a really good 
real estate podcast and it's solely about real estate teams because yeah. it's like real estate teams probably last 10 years got super popular yeah. 20 years ago barely anyone had didn't them exist, yeah. people didn't really talk about them i think it was like when everything became more mobile when youtube became huge you know people are reading more books there's just more content yeah therefore people could educate themselves and kind of pick their lane um and then the third way you could do it is you could be an office like you could be a brokerage that could be an independent brokerage like copper hill real estate or that could be a franchise real estate brokerage like a Keller Williams or a Caldwell Banker, a Remax, Compass. You know, there's lots of players out there now. So, so let me talk about a little bit from my perspective as a like, what kind of got me like juiced up about this podcast, really? Because the more you and I were BSing about it, I just looked at it as like, you know, I mentor just over 30 agents at my business. And we do biweekly sales meetings. I do individual mentoring. I do events. Like there's lots of ways that I mentor my team. But again, it's it's a small specific group in our market of Philadelphia. And while I enjoy, you know, the one-to-one and the small group, maybe there's more I can add to people all over the country, all over the world. I mean, it's like people listen to podcasts. There's someone out the there place. right now in Argentina. It's like, when is Tim putting out this I, next episode? I, I think you're right. So I would have said, you know, I would have said Chile, but we can go with Argentina. Um, Huge following. Yeah. In I mean, they're just waiting. The numbers. The numbers. <laughs> out of control. Um, so it was like, that's what really got me juiced up. Like, yeah. I looked at it as like, okay, what can I share? Because I'll, I'll be honest with you. When I listen to podcasts, when I consume content, whether I'm... I'm more of I'm more of a visual learner. So yeah. I'm either watching stuff on YouTube, I will listen to things. I'm not much of a as we know, you're the better man. I don't really pull I don't I don't open a two hundred page book and read it. They, it's just not my thing. They know that. Yeah, I, they I know. know they know that. But man. this is your first episode. I'm just gonna make it very clear. It's just like Mooney Mooney's Mooney's here and I'm right here. So let's just be clear about that. Um so so talking about those different things because I'd never really had a real estate team, but one, I've been a solo agent. So I started as Tim Garrity, licensed real estate agent, and I created my own individual agent brand, which was called Philly Urban Living. That was me focusing on real estate in the city, what's going on in the city, what are the stats in the city, what's the lifestyle like in the city, you know, why would someone live in Philadelphia versus New York versus LA versus El Paso? I mean, I never compared to El Paso, but I'm just throwing we'll throw that it out in there. there. Yeah, we'll throw yeah. it in there. Uh, and that was how I built out my individual agent business was through a personal brand, which not a lot of people were doing that back then. I was I was basically doing content marketing. That yeah. was my approach. Yep. I used that content in a lot of different ways. I used it through a blog. I used it through email. I used it through in-person networking, through community service. You know, I donate to a charity and... They'd have an event and my logo would be there or like sponsor a, a baseball team or little league. Yeah. I, I did all In that stuff. Outfield. Yeah. They're like 300 bucks and you get your, you get your logo out here for like three months. And I'm like, no brainer. Um, so I did a lot of that. And then I transitioned from being a solo agent with a personal brand to a real estate brokerage. And again, like I said, you can go independent, like a Copper Hill, you can go franchise like the companies I, I just mentioned. And the reason I really chose to go independent was because I wanted to do different, to do it differently. I wanted to be different. I didn't like a lot of the flaws in the system of how real estate has grown residential real estate, knowing that within five years or less, 87% of the agents are going to get in and out of the business, which is a disturbing factor. So it's like 13% are surviving after five years. Why is that? I looked at it as like, there's just so much information out there. It's a very low barrier of entry. People are just going to listen to whoever we want to listen to. And if they don't like it after six months or three years, they're just going to bail out. When I looked at Copper Hill Real Estate, I wanted our philosophy to be different. It's more of a relationship-driven model than it is about cold marketing, picking up the phone, talking to people you don't know, knocking on doors, and throwing information out there. And... The reason I thought a brokerage was better than a team, so this is kind of tied all together, was that with a team, I'd either have to go work for an independent brokerage, which isn't as common, or I'd have to go be a team within a, a bigger brokerage, like a franchise brokerage, which I didn't really follow that philosophy. So yeah. I wasn't really finding my spot. Yeah. And then also, I just thought low barrier of entry to start a real estate brokerage. And 
you know, I can do whatever I want. I can run it any which way I want. There is no big brother. There's no red tape. How much does that happen? So let's say, you know, in the big box real estate offices, because we kind of come across this uh, a lot in insurance, but how much do they kind of oversee or, you know, put these guidelines in place as to like, can't do this, you can't do that. You know, if you do that, you have to do it this way and kind of like ask for permission yeah. and send it through like their marketing department. Hey, can I get approval to push it? Like, is there a lot of that or, yeah. or was there like a little bit now there's more or like, where does it, where does it stand nowadays? I would say there's like two major forms of red tape working for those big companies. One, you're going to learn as you go. I mean, I've never worked for one, but I have people at my brokerage yeah, that sure. have, so I've learned a ton. Yep. One is like you get in and they're like, this is how, use use this technology to do this, use this technology to do that. And when you're done with your closing, we want you, when I first got in the business, we want you to put a paper file together and it's got to have, it's got to be in this order because that makes it smoother for our team. And there was all this stuff. And a lot of that was like, 20, 25 year old thinking. When we started our company, we're like, we want to be paperless. Yeah. So it's just, it's a different philosophy. So I think there was, a lot, there's a lot of red tape. You just running your business and you're going to learn that as you go. You're like, Hey, maybe I want to start a team now. They're like, okay, well here are 10 things you should know before you start a team. Someone comes to me and wants to start a team. I'm like, why are you starting a team? Tell me about what you envision rather than be like, here are our rules. So it's more on the, would you say administrative side? It's, it's, it's more market. corporate. Yeah. So, and in a big corporation, they're going to run things real tight, real strict. You know that. Um, so there's, that's the one part. The second part I feel like to answer your question is in their culture. So a lot of their culture is driven again, 20 or 30 year old thinking, and they're going to push that all, all day. Cause they're going to say, we're one of the largest brokerages in America or in the world. We have 50,000 real estate agents. We do a convention every year. Like they, they kind of like they're giving you Kool-Aid and they're like, drink the Kool-Aid or get out of here. What's the average age of a realtor? It's 55. Yeah. So it's, so I, I think seeing all those traditional ways of doing business while I was in the business. Cause it was only after five years I started my own brokerage. So it's not like I was doing it for like 15, 20 years. It was five. So it sounds like we do it this way. Cause this is the way we've always done it. Exactly. And we've been successful doing it this way. Yep. And it's like, that's okay. If you live in a vacuum, like totally, you know, nothing changes. And I hate to say it, but a lot of those brokerages, they have a lot of high turnover because they bring agents in that are new, and those are the ones that get out in a year yeah. or 18 months, and yeah. they make their money, and they bring in another crop of 10. Like, they're out there marketing to brand new agents. Like, they want the new agents. Like, bring me 10 a I'm month. Do real estate. Yeah. I mean, it's like, now, who do I market to? Like, who am I looking to bring on a Copper Hills team? I want experienced agents. I want, you know, you got to have a license. You got to have a couple years of experience. You got to have multi-million dollar volume. Got to have an iPhone. Yeah, dude, if you have a droid, it's just like doors right there. Game over. You know, we yeah. already know that. Hey, everyone. This is Tim, your favorite Bricks and Risk co-host. But don't tell Sean. I hope you're enjoying this episode, and I'll get right back to it in a moment. Our audience grows through word of mouth. So if you would please take a moment of your time and give us a review on the platform you're on, that would be fantastic. Please also help spread the BNR word by sharing your favorite episode with a friend. We greatly appreciate your time and trust. Now, back to the show. So let's talk about you and the insurance side of things and like, you know, being an individual agent or being an office. Yeah, I think there's a lot of similarities between what you kind of laid out and how we operate in the insurance industry. And a lot of that is, um, you know, the big box insurance companies. And, you know, when you go sign up with them, it's an exclusive agent. Okay. And what does that mean? Yeah. What, what does that mean? So it's, you sell their products and their products only. All right. So how many products would you say, like, on average, one of those companies would have? Well, I guess I should say it in a, in a better way. Um, so if you go and take a contract with an Allstate or a State Farm, you can only represent Allstate and State Farm. Gotcha. So if they have a product offering, 
then you can sell it. You have to fit within the box. Correct. And if you don't fit within the box, you have to say PC later? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And so it's structured that way. And again, I think a lot like what you kind of mentioned previously, it's like you got these companies that are 100-year-old insurance companies, and they've been successful. State Farm is the biggest co- insurance company in the country. Yep. And so they got that way doing certain things. And, you know, when you sign up with them, they want it done their way. And is I, State Farm bigger than Allstate? Yeah. By a, by a large... Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. I figured, you know, you know, like you got Coke and Pepsi. Yeah, like now Coke's, it's... Coke's a beast. Pepsi just happens to be in second place. Yeah, no, I think uh, Allstate... Uh, Check this year's pre, you know, premium dollars, but I think I'm gonna get fact check on this. Dylan, pull up, yeah. pull up the Dylan. numbers. Dylan, we need some all state. We need some all state. I volume. think uh, State Farm's number one out far uh, in in the lead in front of everyone. Interesting, didn't know that. Yeah, and then all state might be like three or four, cool five, but you know that's their kind of mentality and how they are structured in terms of come in. You sell our products and that's it. And so that's that's one way to get into the business. Um, so it almost sounds like they have like red tape similar to real estate, but it's just a different kind of red tape. It is. Yeah. yeah. And so the opposite of that would be what's called an independent agent or a broker, meaning you can really choose who you want to represent within your agency. Let me ask you a quick question. When you started Mooney Insurance Brokers, how did you know where to go out and get carriers for an independent broker? It's like, who'd you know was going to support you? Because you need, you don't have all State or State Farm, so you're like, I need, I need an insurance carriers, backers for it my was, clients. It was super easy. Um, <laughs> I started not knowing anything. And I literally, literally, for all the insurance people out there, I literally started calling carriers. No way. And be like, hey, I just opened my uh, office and I want to represent your company with your products. Sign- How do I get signed up? Be like, hey, I just pulled out my droid and it's got Google on it, which is how I got your number. Can you help <laughs> me? My name's Sean. So, so literally, so I started calling and they like laugh at you. <laughs> Right? Yeah. They're like, like, what is this, serious? Yeah. They're like, um, unless you have a million dollar book of business and, you know, this laundry list of like stuff the, um, that meet these requirements, we, like, we don't want to talk to you. You're like, I'm just kidding. I'm selling magazine subscriptions. <laughs> you interested? How, can, how many can I put you down for? <laughs> can I put for? you down for uh, what? Uh, Architectural Digest? <laughs> so it was the craziest thing to me because I was so naive that I thought I would just... Oh, well, I'm licensed and yeah. I have an agency. Like, work with me. All these companies are going to want to like, wow, get signed up with me. So, it was a kind of a punch in the gut, being like, oh my god, like I just made this move. Now what? Like, I How can't I even. To, yeah. yeah. And then you kind of like find your way through. Like, all right, you know, like a company like Progressive will give you, uh, like, you know, allow you to rep yeah, them. And they're a big name. Yeah. It's like everyone's heard of Progressive. They get so the then commercials. You, and... Then you kind of find your footing and you, you make more calls. And then like just over the first couple of years, you can like build a little book of business and then use that to parlay to a different carrier to say, hey, look, you know, look what I've done the last two years. Yeah. Um, and then you get some different looks That's that way. credibility and see if you can get other, like, would you say with an independent insurance broker, the goal is to get as many carriers as possible or does that kind of weigh you down a little bit yeah so in the beginning it's, there's always like a before you start and then after you start yeah so before you start it's like yes i want all these carriers as many as i can get yes because the thought is like more carriers the more you'll be able to write because of the appetites for these companies and it just opens more doors and you just have a better selection and what you come to find is like, no, like you don't want as many as you can get because all of these companies have expectations. 
You've got to feed. Yeah, so it's like if they agree to back you, you almost have to write X amount of yes. business through that carrier to keep that yes. relationship. You're like, I don't, I don't know if I can promise that. Yeah. What if I got to send? I don't even know who my person is. Yeah. What if I got to send it to this guy? Yeah. Or this girl? Yeah. So you literally, you lie to their faces saying like, yeah, I can do that for you. Yeah, you're like, done. <laughs> and maybe sometimes you have a good year and you, you know, you can deliver. Yeah. But well, there's a lot of times where you're like, oh, man, this is <laughs> at the end of the year. This is not looking good. All right. Here's another question. So you're getting all your carriers together. Um, did you have any like specific like affinity for like our area? Like, were you looking for like greater Philadelphia companies to kind of build on like the relationship model? Or did that not matter? No, not they could really. Be, they could be anywhere. Yeah. The, the, the number, I mean, the oldest insurance company in the country, I believe Dylan fact check me. Got two. Uh, Philly insurance company uh, or Philly contribution ship. Contribution ship. It's the oldest like 1700. Uh, you have access to that? No. How do you do that? Uh, they're, they work with independent agents. Oh, but you got to get to a certain. Yeah a certain threshold, a lot, most of their agents are like long tenured agents that wow. have been around forever. All independent like you, I'm assuming. Yeah. Yeah. So Very that, cool. But it wasn't um, for them. Uh, and, and so they only write property insurance. So for me, my book is heavy, like um, package, home, auto, umbrella, and that sort of thing. So um, they only do maybe like homeowners and investment properties. Really? So it's like very... They don't even do auto? No. Oh. So yeah. then that kind of, you know, it's not to say it wouldn't work because maybe you'd get an unbelievable yeah. package for your yeah. homeowner's insurance. You're like, sure. who, who cares? It's auto, yeah. it's auto debit. Yep. Um, but it, they're a great company. I just didn't, um, you know, I, I wouldn't like go to them to say, hey, I've got this company that's, you know, in Philly or anything like that. Let me correct that last statement. Auto debit if you have a Mac. Not not an Acer. <laughs> we were talking about this. Sean's rocking the Windows Acer. And I'm like, Dude, this what? is like a souped up Acer. I'm this like, isn't like a what is that like an in-house brand at Big Lots now? Do you think this is like off the shelf Acer? I mean, his his Acer is like is like half the size of this desk. You can't really see all of it, but I'm I'm telling you folks. It runs massive. It runs DOS programs better than most. He's got one of those little like dolly carts that goes on two legs and throws his laptop on it to come in. Uh, <laughs> All right. Well, let's get back to it. Um, so that gives you an idea as to like being the exclusive agent. Yeah. Right. And working for an agency that is exclusive yep. versus the alternative, which is an independent, what I call like a brokerage that has access to many, many carriers. All right. So let's talk about those two layers because I kind of went into my layers. Yep. So you were, you were an agent, uh, a producer, Yep. At State Farm and Allstate. Yep. You work for the two big dogs. Yep. And then when you did that, you said, I want to go my own route. And when you went your own route, you said, I'm not going this direction. Yeah. I'm going to go my direction, which is Mooney Insurance Brokers. Yep. Like, talk about that. So if someone's like in that same spot you were in, yep. like what, you know, what, what kind of things would you share to kind of help? I think it's, it's very different these days. Uh, getting carrier appointments with independent carriers in the year 2024 isn't like when I started. It's 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 way harder. And companies right now are struggling to get profitable. So everything just tightens up, right? Yep. So um it's not like you as hard as it was for me to kind of like talk to these companies and get contracts with these companies, it's even harder nowadays. Yeah. But um you know I think that uh Things that they should kind of be cognizant of is, um, you know, really what did they want? You know, because part of the reason that I wanted to be an independent brokerage was during my time working for those carriers, we'd have so many risks that would come to our door, or call us, referrals, you name it. And they would say, hey, you know, we, we've got our personal insurance with you. Um, can you do my business insurance? Right. Right. And a lot of those opportunities were lost. Wow. So 
you got to see all that over your 10 year period. It's yeah. like, what, what are we doing? Yeah. Like, why are we not? Again, that goes into the relationship thing. Yeah. You're, you're looking at it less as numbers. Like State Farm and Allstate, they're behemoths for a reason. It's all numbers. Yep. Like, here's what we offer. Get as many people to fit within those boxes as possible. Yep. And you were looking, it's like, nah, I really want to work with people I know and build that relationship. And the people that I don't know that come to me, we're going to create a relationship and take that long term. Yeah. And obviously have the offerings, you know, we, could, we, we literally sent, the, so if that person came to us, hey, you do my personal insurance, I want you to look at this. Go down the street and talk to Bob. Yeah. So it's like we had stuff that was coming in that, you know, we didn't even entertain or have a conversation yeah. about. That's interesting. So that kind of got the wheels turning in my head is like, all right. I don't want to be just home auto and turn everything else away. Right. So as a business model, um, you know, we do like a lot of life insurance in our office and you can't do that, uh, you know, for some of those uh, other companies. All right. So that, no, thanks for sharing all that. That brings us to like our next bullet, which is really, so we're talking about like the purpose of the podcast, why, why, why we set out to do this. And then really the second part is you and I felt like there was an audience out there of listeners who want tips, tactics, you know, experience from business owners who've done it. Yeah. You know, and again, there's, there's a lot of podcasts where uh, you're listening to people who have done it. Maybe they were like selling or maybe they like started a business and they did it for like three years, five years, 20 years. It doesn't matter. But there's also a ton of podcasts of people who are just super sharp, extremely smart. Yep. They read a lot. They digest a lot. They have opinions on things. And then they're like a little bit more of like a motivator or like a consultant or, you know, they're just a, a business person, let's say. It. Well, I think there's a lot of people out there. I mean, think about it. If you're in their seat, right? Like if you're a new uh, person into real estate, Yep. Or it's something that you want to get into. I mean, one of the things that I would look to is, number one, talking to people face-to-face in the industry. That would be number one. Yep. Number two is like, where else can I get ideas about being in real estate? Yeah. And so I think you and I, it's we kind of thought that, all right, there is a there is an audience out there that may be looking for insights into how these types of businesses are run, how they're structured, how to be successful and different ways to do it. So yeah, I think, I think there's a ton of people out there that are those newbie uh, professionals that are either just getting started or want to get started that are, you know, looking for this type of information. Yeah. And one thing um, to support that, that point that I thought about when we were starting this podcast is like, you know, I've interviewed so many different agents, you know, new people getting into the business, people who have been in the business, they're thinking about, you know, switching to a different brokerage. Maybe I did a deal with someone, they were on the other side, we got along, we get coffee, we're just chit chatting, figure out, you know, can we work together? Do we keep staying in our separate brokerages? And one thing I always have noticed, I think one, I'm very direct, you know that. Um, I'm also an open book. And I think when people would approach me and ask me questions about Copper Hill real estate or about real estate in general, like how I got started, like I would just share very valuable information with them and expect nothing in return. Because if there's something that I can do to potentially help you get to where you're going, like there's a reason we're having coffee right now. There's a reason we're on a Zoom or whatever. Yeah. It's either we know some of the same people, like you reached out to me, you were very polite, you just said, hey, you know, I'm interested. So therefore, you have my time. And then when I would speak to a lot of agents, a lot of agents would say, no one's, no one's ever said that to me before, or no one's ever put it that way about like a lot of agents failing uh, five years or less. And I'm like, because unfortunately, some of the larger companies don't want you to know that because unfortunately, a lot of them are perpetuating that as much as I don't want to say it, it's yeah. true. Now, again, have I brought in new agents and have they failed? They have. Sure. It's been super rare. Have I brought in agents from different brokerages and they said I'm going somewhere else? Yeah, that's a little bit more common, but 
Producers are going to switch brokerages every like three, four years because they're just going to go leverage themselves to go and try and get a little bit more money, better split, more opportunity, more mentorship, more tech, whatever it is. So I think I'm transparent to a fault. Yeah. Like if you come to me and I've had conversations in the last like couple of weeks where, you know, people are like, hey, can I ask you about your agency? And I'm like, shoot, done. Like whatever you want. Uh, I, like I don't hide anything. Yeah. And I don't feel like uh, there's a lot of people, I would say the vast majority are are guarded. Like, yeah, no, I don't no. want to give my information. You're going to take it and use it against me or steal my business. And it's like, yeah, you know, there's enough business for everyone. That's, and, and a lot of people I listen to online, it's it's the abundance mindset. Yeah. And it's it's very simply like, there's enough out here for, totally. for all of us. For everyone. For everyone to eat and, and be full. And like there, nothing I'm going to say to you, I was talking, I mean, I, I tell people, I, I tell them everything that I do. Like it's, I really don't hide anything. And it's because if it can help you, right, go do it. Yeah. You know, um, I, I don't think that me offering uh, something about my business is going to diminish my business and take away from, from what I do. You know how, how I've always looked at it, which this is the point you're getting at is that when we were getting started, we would want people to be up front with us. Yeah. So like if we were getting started and we both had the drive, the work ethic, the hustle, like we wanted to build things and we wanted to go out to people who have built things. We're like, can you just like share some information as like how hard it was or, you know, how much money it was or how much time it took or what did you sacrifice or, you know, what, what were the stumbling blocks? And most people don't want to, but again, let's say like one out of 10 will actually say, sure. Yeah. And they'll sit down with you because you and I have both had people in, in our lives, in our business careers who have done that for yeah. us. And I think that again, with this podcast, it's the same thing. If we can help someone get to where they're going to go, I mean, they're they're out there listening to podcasts for a reason. They're looking for advice. They're looking to up their game. They're looking to grow. Again, whether you're in the U.S. or or Argentina. Kosovo. Yeah. Or <laughs> or anywhere. It's like... Wait, they do real estate in Kosovo. I they bet. do real estate everywhere, Might man. Might be a new market. Insurance, too. I'll look into that. It could be a good second office. But uh, no, there's people out there. There's people out there looking for the information. So uh, this is a great point. We had to do it face to face. We had to search these people out. We did. And and find people that were operating in our industries and get them to agree to sit down with us. Yeah. Now, this same information we're offering up is like free to have. Yeah. And now, well, and here's a little another point to like the podcast, like we're, we're now interviewing guests and from different markets in the country because why we have relationships with them. We've connected with them yeah. over the years. We've done business with them. And then we're looking to take it up a notch. We're like, well, if you would come on the show and share what you know, from your experience, we have all three of these minds going at once, which, which just takes it up to another level. I mean, you and I, Hey, local to Philly, like we've built our businesses and we got things to add, but isn't it even better to bring in someone who's known on a national or international scale and like, just get that conversation going. Yeah. I mean, it's just like another layer, especially when you have someone that is like super good at like one specific thing. Yeah. Right. And, and maybe they do it a little bit differently and to have them come in and, you know, share that. It's just, it's, it's for the listeners and it's why we, we, why we started this. I love it, man. Well, that's all we have for this episode, folks. So thank you again for tuning in to Bricks and Risk. See you soon. Thank you for joining us on another episode of Bricks and Risk. Our goal is that you walk away with one or two valuable nuggets, and we greatly appreciate you sharing your time with us today. You can find all BNR episodes on Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube, and anywhere else you get your podcast content. Until next time, keep learning and keep growing.